In this short crash course, we're going to go over how you can create digital fashion animations using Marvelous Designer with Blender. We'll first go over the basics of Marvelous Designer. Then we'll create our own outfit, simulate it with an animation, set up a simple scene in Blender, and then finally render it. So let's start off by opening up Marvelous Designer. Now there's definitely a lot going on here, but you'll soon realize how intuitive and straightforward a lot of the features actually are. Before we go over the basic navigation, let's first import an avatar into our project. Now by default, Marvelous Designer comes with avatars we can use. If you navigate to the avatars folder here, you can choose between male, female, or stylized avatars. And then you can simply double click on whatever avatar you want to import it. For me, I'll be using an avatar model I downloaded from Daz. If you wish to follow along using the same model as me, you can download my digital fashion starter kit. This comes with all the project files, plus more than 30 starting templates I've designed that you can use in any of your projects. But feel free to use any avatar that you want. To import our avatar, we can go to File, go to the Import option, and then select FBX. And then we can select our base model. Now we will get this pop-up, and here you just want to make sure that you have the same setting selected as me. The default scale should be in centimeters, but if it's not, then make sure you change it. And then we can click OK to import our model. Now we have our character into our scene. And the first thing I actually want to do here is just change the texture surface to monochrome, just so it's a little less distracting. Now to navigate around in a 3D window, we can use this scroll wheel on our mouse to zoom in and out. We can hold the middle mouse button to pan around. And then we can use the right click on the mouse to orbit. Now in the 2D pattern window, we can once again hold the middle mouse button to pan and then use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. The 2D pattern render is used to create and lay out all of our garments. So to start off, let's create a simple top for a character. We can do so by selecting the polygon tool here. And then we can start plotting points to create a basic shape for our top. Now, if our top is symmetrical, we only need to create one half of the shape. And you'll see why we do that in a second here. And once we connect all the points, you'll notice the garment pop up in our 3D window. Now, to create the other half, we first need to select the Transform Pattern tool. Now, if we right-click, we can clone the pattern by selecting the Symmetric Pattern with Sewing option. Now, the reason we do it this way is because now if we select our Edit Pattern tool and start moving points around, it will also move the point on the other side as well. This just saves us a lot of time and it ensures our clothing is perfectly symmetrical. Now, this is just the front of our top. To add the back side, Let's select our transform pattern tool once again and then drag select both of our patterns. Now we can copy our patterns and then paste them to the side. Now in our 3D window, let's move the back side of our top to the back side of our character. Now here we want to make sure to rotate our garments as well, so the dark faces are facing the inside. The dark faces indicate the inside of our clothing and we want to make sure that they're facing the right way. Once we have the garments in place, we want to start sewing the pieces together. We can do this by selecting the segment sewing option. And then we can select the edges we want to sew together. Now in the 3D window, you'll see these lines showing the pieces that will be sewn together. You want to make sure that the, these lines are parallel. Now the reason why the other side was automatically sewn for us is because we chose to clone the pattern with symmetrical sewing earlier. Now we can also sew the top pieces together and then also the middle pieces as well. Now in the 3D window, I'll also quickly move the pieces apart so you can see all the sewing lines. Now once we have all the pieces ready, we can finally click the simulate button. And with that, we have officially created our first piece of clothing. Now I quickly want to go over some common sewing mistakes that people make. The first one is selecting the wrong edge. If we select the wrong edge to sew, then we'll have our lines crossing each other like this. And this will lead to simulations that look like this, which you obviously want to avoid. Another common mistake is sewing the garments in the wrong direction. This is when you start sewing from the top of one side and then the bottom of another side. You'll get sewing lines that intersect like this. And this will lead to your garment looking like this when you simulate it. And once again, something you want to avoid. So to summarize, make sure your sewing lines are always parallel. Now let's take some time to edit our pattern to make it look a little more like an actual t-shirt. To do this, I'm going to reference a pattern of a basic t-shirt I found online. Now I can use the edit pattern tools to match my pattern to look as close as possible to this one right here. A quick note, while we're moving a point, we can hold shift and that will lock the point along a single axis so we can move it in a straight line. I can also use the edit curvature tools to add some curvature to my patterns as well.
Now we also have these seams along the middle of our shirt which we want to get rid of. So to do that let's select our edit pattern tool and then select the edges we want to merge. Now we can right click and select the merge option. And we can do the same for the back as well. Now our shirt also needs sleeves, so let's add those next. This time let's use a rectangle tool to create a new pattern. And we can then move this piece in our 3D window, so it's right above our arm. Now I want to determine the middle point of my sleeve, since I need to sew one half to the front of the shirt and then one half to the back. To do this I can use the add point tool. Now if I hover around the middle, it should lock into the center here. Now to sew my sleeve, this time I'll be using the free sewing option. It works pretty much the same as a segment sewing, except you choose the length you want to sew. And since I'm sewing half the sleeve to the front and then half of the sleeve to the back, this option works a lot better. Once again, we always want to double check our sewing lines to make sure we haven't sewn anything incorrectly. Now if we simulate, our sleeve should fall nicely on our arms just like this. Lastly, we want to sew the two edges of our sleeve to each other, and then simulate once again. Let's now clone the sleeve for the other side as well, and if we choose the symmetric pattern with sewing option, it will automatically do all the sewing for us. Now our sleeves look a little off, and that's because the sleeve shape typically looks like this, and not what we have right now. So let's edit our pattern to try to match it as close as possible to the sleeve in the reference. So let's start with dragging the middle point out. And then we can use the smooth point tool to create the curve at the top. Now we can continue to make changes to our pattern until it looks close to the sleeve that we want. And with that our sleeve looks a lot more like an actual t-shirt sleeve. Now to create a basic t-shirt it was a slightly tedious process. We even had to reference what a basic t-shirt pattern looked like before we were able to make one. But luckily Marvelous Designer actually provides us with basic starting templates that we can use. And this makes our life a lot easier when designing more complicated items like hoodies and jackets. And once again I've also created my own template pack that comes with my digital fashion starter kit which you can download off my website. So now let's head to the garment folder and here you'll see the whole list of templates that Marvelous Designer comes with. Now you can stick to the current t-shirt that you just created. I'll use the template provided by Marvelous Designer just for demonstration. So I'm going to delete my current t-shirt and then double click on the template. This should automatically add it into our project. Now we can move it into place until it roughly fits our avatar. Then we can simulate. And you can see how much faster this was than creating our own t-shirt. And once again we have these seams along the middle that we want to get rid of. So we can select the edges and then merge them. Now before moving forward, I want to change the color of our shirt. To do that we can head to the drop down in the top right and then change it to fabric. This menu will list all the fabrics we have in our project. In our case we currently only have one. Now if we then click on this fabric, we could change the settings for it in the property editor. So let's click on the color and then I'll set it to a nice grey color. Now let's add a simple collar to our shirt as well. To do this we can select the edges around the neck and then right click and select the offset pattern outline option. Now we can specify the thickness for our collar. I'll set it to around 20 millimeters. And I also want to make sure that I have the create internal line option selected, which is going to be really important here in a second. And here you can see the internal line that it created, which is shown in red. Now if we right click on this, we can choose the cut and sew option. And this will now separate the collar for us into its own piece. And if we simulate, you can see the collar I just created. Now we also want to do the same thing for the back side as well. And finally we can stitch the two edges together. Lastly we want to select our collar pieces and this time create a layer clone of them. This will essentially duplicate the layer and then stitch it on top to give it some thickness. Now it's really important to note that we won't actually be able to see the proper thickness of our garment until we change our 3D window into thick textured surface view. Now let's add a simple pocket to our shirt. To create a pocket shape inside our pattern, we can use the internal rectangle tool. Then we can create a square shape on one side. Now because we have linked editing turned on, it creates a shape on the other side as well. But we don't really want that so let's select our pattern and then right click and remove the linked editing. 
and now we can delete the other internal shape as well. From here, I'm going to edit the shape by adding a point to the bottom and then dragging it down. And once I'm happy with my pocket shape, I can right click on it and then clone it as a pattern. You can see the pocket shape it created here in the 3D window. Now we just need to sew the sides and the bottom of this pocket onto the internal line. And for that we can use segment sewing or free sewing, it really doesn't matter. And once we simulate, it should attach our pocket onto our t-shirt. A quick note, if you see this red line on your garment, it just means that your 3D window is set to show your internal lines. You can toggle this on and off in the options here at the top. For me, I find it a little distracting, so sometimes I'll just turn it off. Let's now create some pants for our avatar. I'm going to go for a pair of cargo pants like the ones in the reference images here. This time I'll add in the pants template for Marvelous Designer, and we'll get this pop up. Here we want to make sure we select the add option. And once again, we'll need to fit the pants to our avatar. And when we're ready, we can simulate. Now to make it easier to work on my pants, I want to quickly hide my shirt. To do that, I can select all the t-shirt patterns and then right click and select the hide 3D pattern option. Now next, let's give our pants a different color. And while I'm in the fabrics menu, I can also rename these fabrics by double clicking on them. Now with my pants fabric selected, I can go into the property editor and then set the color to a nice olive green color. Next, let's add a simple waistband for our pants. To do that, we can select the top edges, and once again, I can use the offset pattern outline tool for that. I'll leave the distance as 20 millimeters, and then make sure I have the internal line option selected as well. Then I can select the internal line and then use the cut and sew option to separate the waistband. Now next with our edit pattern tool selected, we can start to edit the pattern to get it to look as close to the reference images as possible. I want to go for a nice baggy look, so I'll need to widen out a lot of the points. Now this step usually takes some experimenting and trial and error until I'm happy with how the pants look. Next we can start to add some pockets to our pants. We can use the internal rectangle tool once again to create our pocket shape. This is a similar process to before when we were creating a pocket for our t-shirt. We can then select the internal line and then select the clone as pattern option. Now this time we want our pocket to have more space on the inside. So we can use the offset pattern outline tool. And here we can set the distance of our pocket, and this will determine how much the pocket extrudes out. Now I'll set it to around 10 millimeters. Now we can start to sew the outer lines to our internal lines of our pocket. And then if we simulate, we can see the pocket form nicely. Now here I don't want this top piece of my pocket, so I can use the cut tool and then delete the top part. Lastly, our pocket corners are still unattached, so we can use the segment sewing tool once again and then sew the lines together. And we can then clone this for the other side as well. And this should automatically place it at the right spot. Now cargo pockets usually also have some flaps on the top as well. So let's add those next. We can use our rectangle tool to create the flap shapes. And we want these to be roughly the size of our pocket. Now we can also use a smooth curve tool to add a little bit of roundness to the corners. And then finally we can sew this pocket flap to the top of our pocket. And once again, we can clone this for the other side as well. Now at any point, we can change the placement of our pocket by moving the internal lines. And then if we simulate, everything should automatically move to its new location. Now let's go ahead and create the cargo pocket on the side. Now this is slightly more complicated because the pocket is split between the front and the back. So with our internal line tool selected, we can start to draw out one half of the pocket. Here it's important to remember the length and the height because we'll need it later. So for the front, I'll use a length of around 80 millimeters and height of around 110 millimeters. And once we set our lines, we can press enter to finalize our internal line. Now we can do the same thing for the back side. Once again, I'll try to get it to around 80 millimeters for the length and around 110 millimeters for the height. Now you can see the lines on the back are slightly off. So I can select them and then move them up so they match up as closely as possible. Next, we can select our rectangle pattern tool. And now if we press it anywhere on our 2D pattern window, we can specify a width and a height for our pocket. Here, we'll set the width to 160 millimeters. And that's because we have the 80 millimeters on the front and the 80 millimeters on the back. And then we can set the height to 110 millimeters. And once we move the garment in place, we can use the free sewing tool to sew one half to the front and then one half to the back.
And from here, we can copy this pattern over and then use the offset pattern outline tool once again to start creating our pocket shape. This process is pretty much the same as before. And then we can use the segment sewing to sew all the pieces together. Now here, I also want to separate the inner pocket shape from the edges by using the cut and sew option. Now this isn't important, but I want to give my pocket corner some roundness. So I can use this smooth point tool and then just go over the edges that I just split up. For this pocket, I want to add a zipper on the side as well. And we can do this by first using the internal rectangle tool to create a thin rectangle shape. Then we can convert this into a hole. Now we can select the zipper tool in the 3D window and then we can draw out our line for the top and then we can double click and then draw out our line for the bottom. And then we can follow the same process to duplicate the pocket for the other side as well. Next, I want to create some regular pockets at the top. In my case, they don't really need to look super realistic. So I'm just going to fake the look to save me some time. I can use the internal line tool to create the basic shape and then use the edit curvature tool to round out the bottom. I can also duplicate this internal line and then place the second one next to the first one. Then I'll use the cut and sew tool to cut out this piece. Once again, I can use the layer clone tool to give it some thickness. Now, this doesn't look super realistic yet, but once I add in the stitching, it will look a lot more realistic. Next, let's add in the J stitch that we commonly see on pants. And once again, I'm just going to fake the look since I don't really need these to look super realistic. Here, I also need to remove the linked editing for my pants since I only want the stitching to be on one side. Then I can start to draw out the shape using my internal line tool. And this time I'll use a smooth point tool to round out the bottom. And once again, I'll make a duplicate and then place it next to the first one. Now let's go over how we can add some stitching to our pants. We can select the top stitch tool and then apply it to the line similar to our sewing tool. If we then zoom in on our garment, we can see the stitching lines being applied. And I'm going to go ahead and add it to the pockets and any other seams that we might see top stitching on. Now for the cargo pocket flap, I added an internal rectangle inside and then added top stitching to that as well. And here's how my pants look after I've added all the stitching. Now we can also change the way that our top stitching looks. If we go to the top stitch drop down, we can see the default top stitch that we just applied. Now if we click on this, we can see all the properties that we can change in the property editor. This includes the length, the spacing, the color, and much more. We can also change the complete style of our top stitch by going into the materials folder, then the hardware and trims folder, and finally selecting the top stitch folder. Inside, we can see a list of all the different types of top stitching that we can apply. We can then drag one of these into our top stitch list. Now to apply this to our garment, we'll need to select the edit top stitch tool. Then we can select either a specific top stitch line or all the patterns we apply the top stitching to. Then in the property editor, we can change the style from default to our new top stitch that we just added. Then after a second or so, you can see the new top stitch applied to our garment. Now in my case, I'll actually be sticking to the default top stitch, so I'm going to undo what I just did, but I wanted to show you how you could change it if needed. Now we can also change the way our zipper looks as well. If we click on our zipper, we can see all the different properties we can change here in the property editor. If we click on the puller, we'll get a different set of properties here, and here I'll change the styling of my puller and my slider. And once again, if we head into our materials folder and then into the zipper folder, we can see the full list of different styling options we get for our zippers. Next, let's add some buttons to our pants. To do this, let's click on the button dropdown in the 3D window. And then let's first select the buttonhole option. Now let's add a buttonhole to our waistband. And if we zoom in on our garment, we can see the buttonhole added. Now let's head back to our button dropdown and this time let's select the button option. We can then add a button on top of our buttonhole. And this should look something like this. 
To change the styling of our button, we can head to the button dropdown and then select the default button. Now in the property editor, we can change the shape, the width, the thickness, the color, and many more properties. Now in my case, I'm going to change the shape to a different one. Lastly, I also want to add some buns to my cargo pockets as well. And for these, I'm going to first add a new bun to my list. Then I'll give it a new name. And then in the property editor, I'll change the shape of the bun to something more suitable for the pocket. And then I can add in these buns in the 2D pattern window. Now the buns are a little too big, so I'll head to the property editor once again. And this time I'll change the width to around 18 millimeters. And with that, I'm pretty happy with how my pants turned out. Now, of course, we can add a lot more details, but for the sake of keeping this video as short as possible, we're going to move on to the next part. Now let's go over how we can add different fabrics to our garments. So first, let's unhide our t-shirt. And then let's open up the fabrics tab. Now to add new fabrics, we can go into the fabrics folder. And this is located inside the materials folder as well. Here we have the list of all the different fabrics we can choose from. And when you hover over a specific fabric, it also gives you more information about that fabric as well. For my shirt, I'm going to go with a basic cotton material. And when I find one that I like, I can just drag it on top of my current shirt fabric. This will replace our old shirt fabric with our new one. And if we look at our shirt more closely, we can see all the fine details in the fabric as well. And this looks a lot more realistic than before. Now we can select our t-shirt fabric and then change the color back to a gray that we had before. Now, if we go into the physical properties drop down, we can see a list of sliders that determine how our fabric stretches and folds when simulating. Now, by default, each fabric will have a different set of values for these. For example, leather feels and behaves much differently than cotton. So these values will probably differ quite a lot. And I would recommend you leave them as they are, unless there's a specific look that you're going for. Now, another value we can change here is the thickness of our fabric. By default, this type of cotton is around half a millimeter, and we can change this value if needed. Just remember that you need to be in thick textured surface view to see how it actually looks. Let's now add a new fabric for our pants as well. And once again, I'll change the color back to our olive green that we had set before. Now, say if we want to change the fabric of a specific piece of our garment rather than the whole thing. For that, we could simply drag the new fabric onto that piece. And this will make sure that the fabric gets applied only to that specific piece. So at this point, we've pretty much covered all the basics for creating new garments. Now let's cover some important simulation properties that are super helpful to understand. First one being particle distance. This is what determines the poly count of our clothing. In our 3D window, we can select the wireframe on surface view to see the geometry of our garments. Now let's select our pants pattern. And if we change our particle distance to 10 millimeters, you'll notice the poly count get much higher. This will result in a more accurate simulation of our garments but it will also take much more computing power. So you don't really want to set it super low because it'll start to take forever to simulate. And this also becomes an issue when we import it into Blender because it will take a lot longer to render. I will personally set mine to around 10 to 15 millimeters when I'm ready to export. But while I'm working on it in Marvel's Designer, I'll usually leave it at the default at 20 millimeters. Two other handy settings to change are the shrinkage weft and the shrinkage warp properties. Now I'll demonstrate what these do. Say we want to make these specific parts that I've selected looser. Then we can set our shrinkage weft value to anything above 100%, say 110% or even 120%. And this will loosen our garment for us. Now, if we want to tighten those parts, in that case, we can set the value to less than 100%, say about 90%. Shrinkage warp is pretty much the exact same thing, except now in the vertical direction. So this will make our pants longer or shorter. And this is a great non-destructive way to edit the fit of our pants without changing or messing up our actual patterns. For me, I'll make the fit of these pants slightly looser by setting the shrinkage weft value to 110%. Now, we already discussed how we can add thickness to our fabric, but we can also add thickness to the patterns by changing the thickness rendering value. This is super helpful when you want to increase thickness to a specific part rather than the whole garment. Now, lastly, I want to add a puffer jacket to this outfit as well. Luckily, Marvel's designer has a template that we can use. Once I add the jacket into my project, I can fit it to my avatar and then simulate. I want this jacket to be unzipped. So to do that, I can select the zipper 
and then uncheck the fasten zipper checkbox in the property editor. I also want to get rid of this waistband for this jacket, so I'll select those patterns and then delete them. Next, I also want to reduce the roughness of my jacket fabric. So I can select my jacket fabric and then change the roughness slider in the bottom here. Now I also want this jacket to have a baggier look. And like I mentioned before, an easy way to do that is to increase the shrinkage weft and the shrinkage warp values. I also created a logo that I want to place on my pants. To do this, we can select the graphics tool and then select the graphic 2D pattern option. Here we can select our logo file. Now I can click on the pattern that I want to apply this graphic to. And with the logo added, we're finally done designing our outfit. Now we're going to go over how we can simulate our outfit with an animation and then render it out in Blender. But first, an important thing to fix is our UVs. So let's open up the UV editor. And I'm also going to drag it out here so we get a better look. Now, if you don't know what UV mapping is, it's essentially how an object in 3D space can be unwrapped into a texture in 2D space. This is how we're able to apply 2D images as textures on our 3D objects. Now, you don't actually need to fully know how this works. Just remember the following steps. So here you'll see all of our patterns. Now everything is all over the place and this is bad, so let's fix it. The goal here is to get everything neatly organized in a one by one square and make sure that there's no overlapping pieces. So first we can right click and choose the reset UV to 2D arrangement option. And this will get rid of most of the overlapping. Now next we can right click once again and this time select the fit all UV to zero to one. This will place it in a one by one box like this. Here it's good practice to try to increase the size of our patterns as much as possible. This will result in higher resolution textures for our garments. And lastly, like I mentioned before, we want to make sure that there are no overlapping layers. So let's move everything that's on top of each other into its own spot. Now it's time to add an animation to our avatar. To do this, I'm going to use a free animation software called Mixamo. Here we can upload our character and then follow the steps to rig it. This will allow us to add any Mixamo animation to our avatar. And once our avatar is rigged, we can search for a walk animation and then pick one that we like. Here I went with this specific one and then downloaded it. Now in Blender, in a new scene, I imported this FBX file. And then in the timeline, I duplicated the keyframes to extend the animation. A really important step here is to move the start of the animation forward by 20 to 25 frames. Then in pose mode, with all our bones selected, we want to clear the transformation properties of the bones. This will give us our character back in our original A pose. And then we can press I to insert a keyframe for this pose. And this is super handy because now our animation smoothly transitions from our A pose to our walk animation. Next, I wanna go over how to add shoes to our avatar. You can find a ton of shoe models online. Some will be paid and some will be free. And once we find a model that we like, we can import them into our Blender scene. From here, we just wanna to try to fit the shoe as best as we can to our avatar. And when we're ready, we can select both of our shoes and then select our armature and press Ctrl P. This will open up the parent menu. And here we wanna select the automatic weights option. Now, if we press play, our shoes should move with our avatar. Sometimes you might get this issue when you try to bind your shoes to your avatar. And that just means that there's an issue with your geometry. I've gone over this in one of my previous videos, so check that out if needed. Now lastly, there might be areas around my shoe where my avatar's feet stick out. To fix that, we can go into sculpt mode and just smooth out those areas by holding shift with our brush. Now, before we export our character, I just want to go into the output properties and change my frame rate to 30 FPS. And that's just a personal preference. You can pick whatever frame rate that you want. And now with our character and shoe selected, we can go into the file dropdown and then choose the Olympic file format. Here, just make sure that you have the same export settings as me. And the reason we export it as an Olympic file is because then we're able to export it with the animation binded to it. Now, heading back into Marvel's Designer, we can import this Olympic file into our project. And once again, just make sure you have the exact same import settings as me. Now we can open up the animation editor in the bottom and this will show us our timeline. And here we're able to see the animation data for our character and our shoes. 
And once we simulate our clothing, it will also get added in this timeline. Now before simulating our clothing with the animation, I just want to quickly fix the pants at the bottom here, just to make sure that they fold nicely over the shoes. Now to get a better simulation result, we can change the simulation quality to stable. This does take a lot longer to simulate, but I find the results to be much better. And once we're ready, we can click the record button and wait. Now you'll quickly notice that as my simulation is happening, my jacket is starting to fall off my avatar. And this is a pretty common issue. Luckily there's an easy fix for this, and that is to use the tack tool. We can find the points that our jacket starts to fall off our character, and then tack those points into place. And when we're ready, we can record the simulation once again. And this may take some time depending on how fast your computer is. I'm going to speed up the footage here, just so you don't have to wait it out with me. And once our clothing simulation is baked in, we can quickly play it back just to make sure that everything looks fine. And lastly before exporting, I quickly want to go into the top stitch settings, and then change the type to texture rather than obj. Now this significantly reduces the poly count, because the stitching is no longer a 3D geometry, but instead it's just a texture baked into the clothing. And when we're ready, we can export our outfit as an Olympic file. Now for the export settings, make sure you have the thick option selected, and set your texture map size to 4K for better results. The export process can take some time as well, and when it's done we should have our Olympic file and a list of our texture maps. Now let's head back into Blender, and we can now import our Olympic file into our scene. Here you want to make sure you set your scale to 0.01, .01. otherwise your outfit will be way too big. And now our outfit should fit perfectly on our character. Now by default our garments won't have any materials applied, so let's head to the shading editor. And with our outfit selected, let's add a new material. Now for the next step we need to use the node wrangler add-on. So let's go into preferences and just make sure we have the node wrangler add-on installed. So it should have a check mark beside it, if it doesn't just quickly enable it. Now with our principal BSDF node selected, we can press Ctrl Shift T and then this will open up our directory. And here we want to select all of our texture maps. And with that our texture maps should now be applied to our garments. Now from here we have the creative freedom to set up our scene however we want. I'll quickly go through my setup process. First I want to add a camera into my scene, and then move it a couple meters in front of my avatar. Now we can reset the camera rotation by pressing Alt R. And then we can rotate it along the x-axis by 90 degrees so it faces our character. Now next I want to change the aspect ratio of our camera, so it's vertical instead of horizontal. We can do that by going to the output properties, and then changing the resolution to 1080 by 1920. This is the resolution you want to use if you want to post your work on TikTok, Instagram Reels, or YouTube Shorts. Next I want to animate my camera so it rotates around our avatar. To do this we'll first add an empty object into our scene. Then we'll parent our camera to this empty object. Now as we move our empty object, it will move our camera as well. At this point I can spend some more time to change my camera angle using the empty object and make any other adjustments until I'm happy with how it looks. And once I'm happy with the starting position, I can add a keyframe for it on the 20th frame, which is technically our starting frame. Then we can go to the last frame. And here I want to change the rotation in the Z axis by subtracting 360 degrees from it. Then we can add a keyframe for that as well. This will give us one full clockwise rotation around our avatar. Lastly, I want to change the animation interpolation to linear. We can right click on our timeline, then go into interpolation and select linear. Now our camera will rotate around our character at a constant speed. Now you would have noticed that our character stays in the same spot even though he's walking. So let's quickly change that. We can add another empty object into our scene, and this time I'll use the cube and then fit it around our character. Once I have that in place, I want to parent our character, our clothing, and our camera to it. And that way when we move our empty object, everything should move with it. Now with our empty object selected, we can set a keyframe for it on the starting frame. And then we can move to the last frame 
and move our empty object by a couple of meters and add a keyframe for it there as well. And once again, let's set the interpolation to linear by right clicking on our timeline, going to interpolation mode and selecting linear. Now we'll get a better idea of how fast our character is moving. And if our character is moving either too fast or too slow, we can simply adjust our last frame. Now I'm going to add a cylinder into the scene to use as the ground. I'll delete all the other faces until I have the top face left. Now I can move it down to the ground and then scale it so it feels like an endless plane. Now next I want to add some lights for our character. For this I'm going to use a modified 3 point lighting setup. I'll start off by adding an area light that's shining straight down on my character. And in the light settings I can adjust the power of the light until I get the right amount of brightness. Now a quick note, I'm going to be rendering this using the Cycles render engine. So just make sure you have it set to that as well. And then from here I'm going to duplicate this top light and then move it at an angle from the front. And I duplicated the light one more time and then added one to the back as well. And finally I parented these lights to our empty object as well. So when our character moves, the lights follow. Next let's change the environment for our scene. In the world property settings, we can change the color to a sky texture. And by default the strength is a little too bright, so I'm going to reduce the strength of this texture. Now I also want to change the material for our ground. So with the ground selected, we can go into the materials tab, and then here I want to reduce the roughness and then increase the metallicness. This will give us a really cool reflective material. And lastly I'll go back to my world property settings, and then play around with the parameters for the sky texture until I'm happy with how it looks. Now before we render, I want to go into the render property settings and then set my sample size to 256. And here I also want to make sure that the motion blur option is turned on. Now we can go into the output properties and then here set our directory for our animation. Now we can change the file format to ffmpeg and then change the container to mpeg4. And with that we have everything set up so we can go into the render tab and then select render animation. And that is it for this short crash course, I really hope you enjoyed it. You can find all the project files in my digital fashion starter kit in the description below. It has the avatar files, the starting blender files, the clothing templates, and some pre-made blender scenes for you as well. I think you'll find it very valuable and it would also be a great way to support the channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next video.